Good evening and welcome to live stream at the Upper Room. My name is Ron Strand and we are glad that you're joining us tonight. Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Can you believe it's 2021? Oh my gosh. Hey, if you're viewing for the first time, uh, we are the Upper Room. The Upper Room is a is a uh, uh, independent ministry, and we started in 2009 as a concert uh, ministry concert, and we do events once a month. We're not a church. We're not affiliated with a church. We're our own ministry, 501c3. And uh, when COVID hit uh, back in March, we lost our uh, venue because of the the uh, because of the virus, and we haven't gotten it back yet. But we do once a month. We do Saturday night events. We have Christian artists. We have uh, uh, bands, Christian bands. We have comedians. We have speakers of note, and it's a great time. And we do it in Southern California, Orange County. Uh, but what you know, and I say this every week: necessity is the mother of invention, and. Um, yeah, we're doing a little adjustment there. Uh, so when when we lost our venue, we we started to do a weekly live stream, and it's just turned out so well that we've just continued to do it, and we're going to continue to do it as well. So welcome if you're here for the first time. Last week we had a former lead singer from the group Kansas, John Elfante, and uh, heard some of his testimony and some of the background of the music that he's done and so forth. Uh, but check out some of our past programs on Facebook and on YouTube. If you go to The Upper Room Presents, you'll find our past programs there. And uh, you can see all of them. And they're, they're there for your viewing. Um, like us on Facebook, if you would, at The Upper Room Presents. Well, that's our website there. Uh, like us on Facebook and subscribe to us or subscribe to our page at uh, YouTube. And both, again, are at The Upper Room uh, presents next week. What I think we're going to, well, I don't think we're going to do this. We're tonight. We're going to hear Greg's testimony, Greg, Dr. Gregory Reed's testimony. And, uh, but in today and in this week, as I was going over so much of what Greg does, I was so enamored, so fascinated about what he's doing. I thought we can do two shows. So next week we're going to do part two with Greg. I know you're going to love tonight. So we're really looking forward to, to getting into, uh, Greg's testimony. It's a riveting testimony. So uh, be sure to tune in next week as well. Uh, our website is theupperroompresents.com, and you can go there and learn a little bit more about us, who we are, what we're doing. We're kind of where um, entertainment and culture meets ministry. And uh, we love what we're doing, and we hope you do too. So we'll get right into it tonight. Uh, tonight's guest is Dr. Gregory Reed. He's a retired private investigator with over 20 years experience as a criminal justice trainer on occult crimes. And that's something I'm really in, in, interested and fascinated with, uh, particularly cult crimes against children. Uh, he has authored 11 books. He's been in youth ministry since 1975. He's a graduate of Christ for the Nations uh, School in Dallas, Texas. He holds an honorary doctorate from Logos Graduate School, and he's an ordained minister with the American Evangelistic Association. And he has served, and I'll ask him this, but he either has served or is serving as a youth pastor at Cross Point Church in El Paso, Texas. He is the director of Youth Fire Ministry. That's one word, Youth Fire Ministry. And we are glad to welcome Dr. Gregory Reed tonight. There he is, Gregory how are you? How are you? Good. Good. Can I call you? you? Can what? What do you prefer, Doctor Greg. Greg? Just Greg. You're just plain yeah. old Greg. <laughs> yeah. And the little caveat there: I was a youth pastor at Cross Point and served there for seven years, and now I'm back to full time field ministry. Okay. Yeah. Well, because you're kind of old to be a youth pastor, right? <laughs> Some people said. Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, I, I, well, yeah. It, that's, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I was telling uh, Marisa today before tonight. And I was telling my wife, Kathy, today, I said, when, when I listen to you on your podcast, there's something about your voice that is very soothing and very inviting. I, I don't quite know how to describe it, but you've got a gift there in how you relate and how you come across. It's a very caring voice, and uh, I, I really enjoy it. 
Thank you. <laughs> so you've got the gift of voice. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, one of the things I think, um, you know, it, it says in the book of Revelation, it says that they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the uh, word of their testimony. And I think hearing somebody's testimony, hearing their, their story of how they became a Christian is one of the most powerful things because, you know, frankly, that's what the early apostles did. They testified about what they saw and what they heard and what they did. And, uh, you know, we could do teachings all day long and, and those are needed. But sometimes hearing a testimony is one of the most powerful things that uh, you can hear because it's it's each and each of us has an individual testimony. And so, Greg, I would like to kind of dig into that with you tonight and uh, don't bar us any details. We want to hear it all because I think what you've been through is remarkable. And uh, to see where you are now and what you're doing is uh, quite a blessing. So um, let's jump right into that, if we would. And um, uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what you, what happened, and, and so forth. Well, I grew up in Southern California on the San Fernando Valley. You know, our house is right on the border of Canoga Park and Chatsworth. And it was an ideal place to grow up for a kid in so many ways. I mean, it was, we lived way up in the, in the hills, the foothills. And we had a view of Chatsworth Lake and there's a little country church down the way. It was really in some ways very much like a, you know, um, Andy Griffith type of little. Was it? Yeah. Except behind the scenes, there was this darkness that it's hard to even describe. Uh, my family background, my parents were um, both from Salt Lake City. Uh, they had very horrible growing up circumstances, uh, very brutal circumstances. Were the LDS? Uh, uh, well, the LDS was a big part of it because when you're part of it, my great 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 grandfather uh, was Timothy Foote, who founded uh, Nephi, Utah. Oh, wow. Young. So. You know, when you leave the Mormon Church, as my parents, uh, my grandparents did, uh, then they're you're dead. Yeah. And, uh, so my parents, and grandparents, and parents were left just swinging. My grandmother was involved in the occult to some degree out in Pasadena, California. She had a reputation of being a table tapper, which is somebody that could do the, you know, like communicating with. It's like um, necromancy. It's like communicating with the dead, basically. Wow. Uh, so I was born into a lineage of occultism that went back several generations, I, I believe. And so I was kind of born into it. So as a child, it was not uncommon for me to grow up in supernatural circumstances. And when you're born into it, you don't know what to do with it. I wake up in the middle of the night and I would hear uh, things and I would see, you know, or horrible, ugly, demonic things and didn't know there's nobody I could tell. Um, but in our neighborhood, with all the good that was going on, there were several groups operating. There were several pedophiles that lived in our neighborhood. Um, there were two or three cult-like groups in that area, and there was one particular group that was kind of of a it was kind of a mix of a druid and satanic sort of operation. And um, through my parents having no idea because back then you just trusted your kids with whoever when you had a crisis and we had a lot of physical illnesses and my mom and my dad. And so it was just a few days that took them to slip into the hands of some people in the church that I went to who were Christians by day and practicing, you know, devil worshipers by night. And, uh, I was taken to several meetings over a course of time before I was even like eight or nine years old and involved in ritual um, activities to a certain degree. I don't remember a lot of specifics, some specifics I remember, but I had a friend that I made through the church um, that was actually, that was kind of his job is to befriend me and bring me into their circle as a kid, somebody that could be trusted, whatever, and uh, he, his life was taken on his 13th birthday uh, on the winter solstice. And I, I witnessed that. And uh, it totally destroyed and devastated me. Uh, when groups do this, children, they have in their circle, 
they will drug the children so that they don't remember much what happens. They're very compliant. They'll take them to these things and these horrible things happen. And then they'll just end up being very sick and blotting out some of what they remember. And so that's kind of uh, what happened to me at that point. What, let, let me inter let me interject here because I want to just get a make sure I've got perspective on this. Now, let's just go back to your parents. You said they grew up in a very difficult. Were they uh, were they in the occult? They weren't. I think my mom flirted a little bit with things like Ouija boards and stuff, but not really. She was kind of leaning in that direction. My dad absolutely wanted nothing to do with that or God or anything else. Yeah. But the bloodline was there. I was born on a date that was very important to some of these groups. Okay. I want to explore that. And I also want to explore, you said now you witnessed the taking of this friend's life. This was with the, the occult that did this? Yes. Wow. Now, how old was he and how were, were you at this time? He was 13. I was probably somewhere between 10 and 11, as best as I can recall. Oh, my gosh. And, and so when you say you witnessed that, what what does that mean? Were you at, out at this uh, ritualistic meeting? And Yes, it was It was at a time when we, we it was at, we'd gone to the church. My mom got hospitalized that night very conveniently. And my dad couldn't uh, take care of us, so some friends from church took us to the Christmas uh, event at our church. It was like the Christ, you know, every church does a Christmas program. And uh, I went there with some people from the church, very nice lady, that later found out her husband was involved in all sorts of awful stuff. And I remember going to the church and then going to my friend Mark's house after that. And then everything got, they had, you know, it was his birthday and they had cake and punch and stuff. And, you know, he just, he was all dressed in white. And I thought that was really weird. You know, I mean, I remember the time thinking, what's, what's wrong with what, why are they doing this? And then I started, everything started to spin after that. Once I had some punch from what I recall. And then the next thing, you know, everything was kind of a blur for the next few hours. So the punch was spiked. Yeah. And we later found out there was a, a, a series of drugs that they used back then that they could make children very compliant. I know what they are now. I didn't then. I didn't even know what they had done. Uh, but the rest of it was watching him in a ritualistic situation and uh, watching him eventually. His life was taken with that, me participating in it uh, to some degree, which is hard to uh, talk about because it's still very uh, painful. But... Uh, they involve children in these things so that they carry the guilt. And then after that, I was just a complete mess. That's, I mean, that's got to, I mean, completely mess up a 10, nine, 10, nine or 10 year old mind. Well, I went from being a nice kid, you know, loving kid, loved God, went to church, uh, good grades to all of a sudden I'm a totally different person when I, because I was sick for a couple of weeks after that. And um, when I came back to some sense of health, I was angry. Um, I became just immediately at that age, I became, I, I immediately became involved in the occult voluntarily. It's like something was birthed in me, which it was. That's why they do these rituals on children because they're looking for those to take it to the next generation. And so next thing I'm buying Ouija boards, tarot, not tarot cards, but, the future telling cards and reading everything I can on the paranormal. And I started drinking and, and uh, smoking. And, and you know, At this young age? Yeah. Now, well, now, excuse me when I interrupt because I just want to try all. to get some of the details. But didn't it scare you, though, that you, to go back to these ritualistic meetings where your friend was actually killed? And, I mean, did that well, they come into your thinking? They let me go after that, which is what they do. They'll do all that and leave it, leave them for a period of time to see all that working works out. Uh, it's it's a it's a very involved process, but to to raise a child in this, they have to put them through a bunch of things, and if they survive it, then at some point they can be reinitiated back into the group. So they left me alone for a period of time. Uh, I would not go to the places, certain places in my town, because. I didn't know exactly what it was about, but I was terrified to even go there. I didn't have a lot of recall. I had some, uh, but not all of it. Um, so I just became a recluse, and uh, my parents had no idea what to do. They saw this transformation, and they didn't know what to do. 
Did they know what had happened? They didn't have a clue. My dad didn't know until after my mom passed away. He and I sat down because he was a cop. Oh, really? And I knew when I told him I was going to get one or two reactions, he was going to say, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard in my life. Or I'd get another reaction. And he just sat there and tears came to his eyes. And he said, son, I didn't know. I had no oh. idea that this had happened. And that wow. became a, a bridge between he and I, and which was very badly needed. And he also, being an ex-cop, he tried to help me to trace down some of these things with the LAPD. Wow. They were not interested. But uh, he told me even back then, he said, son, we used to find out in that area, we would find bikes of kids that were just abandoned at the edge of a canyon. And we knew something of that nature took place. But they just disappeared and never came home. That was back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, wow. So I plunged into the occult. I started to drink very heavily. I uh, became highly sexualized. I began to uh, act out on, you know, with just with, with little rages. And I locked myself in my room mostly and studied the occult. And I found out that it worked for me. So like what, do you, what does that mean? It means I didn't need somebody else to play the Ouija board. I can play it by myself and it worked. It would talk to me. Wow. And actually there was a spirit guide that came through the board named Steve Spade that became like my spirit guide. And I studied all of the occult arts. I studied uh, Gene Dixon and Edgar Casey, whatever I could get my hands on. And pretty much everything I did, I, I had a contact with uh, the other side, so to speak. Uh, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. But it became something where I found out there was like a power growing in me. Uh, and so I began to use that to actually recruit other kids into the occult by the time I was in high school. There was actually things that happened before then because it was we went from that horrible thing with my friend and then just trying to blot the whole thing out. And then, um, you know, my, my dog, who we'd had for 12 years, he was my best friend. He died. And I remember praying and saying, God, please don't let my dog die, please. And he died. And I think that's when... Some people just stop believing in God. I, I did something else. Something inside of me said, the reason that happened is because if there is a God, you are so evil that there's no way he could ever love you. That's why he's not answering your prayers. Well, let me let me ask you this. So you're you're deeply in, involved in the occult at this young age. What what was your image of God? And was there what you know, I mean, that's so juxtaposition in terms of, uh, you know, your whole concept of, of spirituality and uh, what was your concept of God? Very, very much what a lot of the new spirituality is about, at least at that juncture, because I didn't go to church anymore because I had a vague recall that really bad people were there. So I just stopped going. Uh, so I started to develop sort of a new age uh, perception that Jesus was a good man, but that's about it. All paths lead to God. Um, you know, uh, there's no such thing as heaven and hell. Heaven and hell are here on earth. Uh, meditation. I started to study every world religion there was to see if there was anything. Because I was drowning. But the occult, you know, the occult, obviously, it, it, the power is from a demonic, sat satanic, demonic. Did, did you understand that? concept of of the devil you know being uh it was just some kind of power thing or what what was it for me it was about having power and finding some sort of meaning because i was so scarred up on the inside that i was willing to try anything to see if there was anything that could make the pain stop we uh we lost our house in a in a fire in 1967 wiped out everything one of the biggest fires in california history wow and that was another evidence for me that if there was a God that he was doing this because he, he did not love me. And then right after that, I was picked up when I was hitchhiking and I was molested when I was 14. And that destroyed everything, everything that you could possibly imagine. You do that to a boy, you, you finished him. And that's what I remember. I actually had, I drank a whole bottle of alcohol right after that. And I was hitchhiking and I, I, I actually said, God, if you're up there, would you pick up somebody to, just murder me because I don't want to live anymore. And again, there was nothing. 
and I began to be more and more demonized. Uh, the more I investigated all this other stuff, the more out of control I was, the more I drank. And uh, I used my classes to recruit kids to tell them who I was, that I was involved in these practices. And if anybody was interested, they could join me. So I got a couple of recruits to follow me. Um, and then uh, everything just started to completely fall apart. And I look in the mirror and whoever was looking at looking back at me was not me. I knew that I had no control anymore over anything that was happening. And I remember one distinct time that I told somebody who was walking home from school, we were talking about somebody we both knew. And I said, I hope somebody takes a gun and just kills him. And my mother woke me up about 11 o'clock that night crying, saying that that person had been killed. Oh my been gosh. Shot. Now, I didn't cause that, but the devil wanted me to think that I did, so I would be totally convinced that I was evil. That, that was my fault. You know, the enemy's very slick about what he does. And so, shortly after that, I was hitchhiking, and this, I don't know, I got picked up two or three times by Christians, and they were so annoying to me. It's like, leave me alone, okay? I get the Jesus gig, please stop picking me up and it was always christian to pick me up somebody would hand me a bible and say god loves you and i'd say okay sure a couple of people pick me up in volkswagens i don't know why but they were popular for preachers back then yeah. they would preach at me and i'd say yeah i get uh -huh. that yeah yeah no i i already prayed the prayer i was getting tired of it and then uh, i got picked up by a guy in a volkswagen it was about 14 and a half or 14 and he said uh, god loves you and i said yeah i know I, I didn't, but, you know, I was trying to get him off my back. Here's why I want you to drop me off. Can you stop talking now? That was kind of my thought. Yeah. And he said, no, son, you don't understand. I, I live in Manhattan Beach. That's like, I don't know, what is it, around about 30 miles from where Yeah, a good 30, 40 miles from there. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. God woke me up this morning and told me to drive out here and be right. And there was going to be a young boy standing on the, the corner of Topanga Canyon and, and Valley Circle. And I was to pick you up and wow. tell you that Jesus loves you. Wow. My whole world fell apart in an instant because I was had these two contradictions. Part of me said, what if this guy's telling the truth? The other part said, it's not possible. God can't love you because you're evil. Even if there is a God, you're evil. And so I was left with this horrible torment. And shortly after that, I was hitchhiking with my last friend who was an atheist. And uh, this guy picks me up in a big old LTD. For those of you younger, it's like, <laughs> think of a boat on wheels. On land. Yeah, the old Ford LTD. Yeah. And he was an older guy. And, you know, you know, we got in the car and he's saying, hey, why don't you guys come to this really cool meeting we have? Uh, we all get together and we rap about God. And I'm, you know, I'm in the back seat going, my friend's going to, you know killed me or him or whatever and and so you know we just he dropped us off he gave us a card we went to my friend's girlfriend's house she wasn't home and my friend says why don't we go to this thing like hey, you're nuts you're the atheist but if you want to go that's fine so we went to this meeting it was a house meeting in Canoga Park California a couple named David Jen Malcolm may God bless them forever for opening up their homes their home to us. Dave was a landscaper at a couple of kids. Got so turned on. His family got so turned on to Jesus. Spirit filled. They opened up the doors. So we got there. Place was packed with kids, adults. They were singing all this non church stuff. Never heard these songs before. But I'm like, this is weird. These people are actually excited about God. Really? You know, because I remember church was not like that for me. Yeah. Well, church was where you were, was the introduction of your, of your, Molestate uh, your uh, introduction into the occult. Yeah, didn't want to go there. So now I'm in this room and I'm not hearing anything because all this demonic fuzz is in my head, right? But at the end, Dave, the guy that led the meeting, said, If anybody wants to receive Jesus, this is how it happens. Da da da. Gives the whole plan of salvation. Anybody wants to receive Jesus, raise your hand. I, I peeked and looked across the room and my friends raised his hand. Oh, really? And I felt a million things at once. I felt glad because he had had such a horrible life. I mean, really 
just really super abused and 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 then sad because he was crossing a bridge that I couldn't go because I was evil so so you felt like you weren't good enough to to make that decision was that tugging on your heart to want to make that decision and you just felt like I can't do that I'm not good enough it was I yeah it was a seed that was planted but all that all that noise saying you can't because you know, look at where you've been look at what's happened to you but the, yeah that that was where the seed was planted so this guy in the LTD dropped us off and he gave us two books Good News for Modern Man, which is a modern Bible. Right. A lot of us remember that one. Sure. And uh, Crossing the Switchblade by David Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And for those of you unfamiliar, he was a little skinny preacher uh, that w was called from God to go to New York City, face down Nikki Cruz, the most dangerous gang leader in New York. Well, I took those books and I did nothing. I went back into blackness. I went back into, if there's anybody out there, please help. And I went on a trip with my parents for a couple of days and I was in a separate motel room and I brought that book and I read the story about the skinny preacher facing down Nikki Cruz, most dangerous gang leader in New York and saying, Nikki, Jesus loves you. And Nikki just pummeling David, just yeah. smacking him and saying, what do you think about that preacher? And David saying, and this, these words, forgive me if I get a little emotional, but this was the moment for me. I read this and it says, Nikki, you can cut me up into a thousand pieces and every piece is going to scream out Jesus loves you yeah. and at that moment I took the book and I threw it against the wall I was so angry so why didn't I know this why didn't anybody tell me God could love the worst why didn't anybody tell me God could that, that God had this kind of love that he had this kind of power so I went home and I was even more confused but I remember when we got home and I say kind of like Paul, whether in the body or, or not, I can't tell you. But I laid down in my bed that night and I said, you know, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Cookie Monster, I don't know if anybody's out there. If there is, please help me because if you don't help me, I can't do this anymore. I was thinking about just ending it because I was in so much pain. How old were you at this point, Greg? 14 and a half, 15, 15. At that moment when I prayed that, probably 14 and a half, at that moment when I prayed that prayer, I was taken out of that room, and I was in some place where I was just standing in an open field, and it was like I was the only person alive. You mean supernaturally? Supernaturally. And wow. I stood there you know, on a desert, like a just deserted planet almost, and all of that pain all of a sudden came up at the same time, just all of the abuse and all of the all of it, all the rage and the hurt. And I just started wailing like a wounded lion. I could just, just like, almost like a roar. And then I looked up in the sky as God is my witness. And I saw Jesus standing on the clouds and he was reaching out his arms to me. And I screamed at him. I said, I can't reach you. You're too far away. And at that moment, I was taken off of wherever I was and hurtled through, I don't know, I know there's a lot of stories that have come out about people who went to heaven. I can just tell you what happened to me as God is my witness, taken through whatever, time, space, whatever. And the last thing I remember is being held in the arms of Jesus Christ and feeling loved for the first time in my life. And then I'm back in my bed and the tears just soaked my pillow. I didn't even believe in Jesus until that moment. I thought he was just a good man. But at that moment, I looked up and I said, I know that you're real. You're not fake. You're real. Tell me what to do now. A few months passed. I called the guy in the, with the LTD. He said he'd been praying for me. It was just getting crazier by the moment. Wow. I ended up taking friends, two friends of mine, or one, two friends, I think. To, I said, we're going to go to this Bible study thing. Same one that you'd went to before or different? Same one. And I stood, I sat right by the door because there was not room anywhere else. My friends could stand around over, but I was right by the door, which I liked because I wanted to run the minute I got there because everything inside of me was screaming, run, get out of there now. And it was like screaming almost. And I was starting to shake and then they did their singing and I heard them doing testimonies and everything else. And then, uh, and then Dave did the same thing. He was the same guy always. And he stood up and said, becoming a Christian is the easiest thing you will ever do in your life. It's not going to cost you anything except your life. 
<laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't even know if I have that. I mean, if God, does God want this, this, does he want that? And Dave said, this is how it happens. Go ahead. Were you going to ask something? Well, I was going to ask what you were feeling um, with your faith, because you'd, you'd, you'd made that commitment in your bedroom, and then you had this special dispensation where God took you up to this place and and uh, kind of a Paul experience, I guess, you know, uh, knocked off his horse and blinded. And um, But what your faith had gone from that couple of weeks until you'd gone back to that meeting, what you were feeling there. But I do also want to just kind of hold that thought because I want to hear what you have to say about that. But if you're tuning in, folks, for the first time, we're talking with uh, Dr. Gregory Reed, and he's sharing his testimony, riveting testimony. But also, folks, if you're watching... Start typing in some questions because uh, if we get toward the end, we want to we want to take some of your questions as well. So, Greg, go ahead. What what were you feeling about your faith at that point? Well, I was scared to death because everything in, I was shaking and everything inside of me. It's like I could almost hear these voices saying, "You're not going to do this," because the other side had invested so much darkness into me. And the demonic junk was so strong that it wasn't going to let me go easy. Yeah. So I sat there and I started to shake, and then Dave did his thing about this is how you receive Jesus. Every head bowed, every clo eye closed, no one around. If you want to make this decision, raise your hand. And I wanted to raise my hand so bad, and it wouldn't budge. It was like really? it was a manacle on it, and I started to shake. And then the tears started to come down my face because I'm like, I felt like if I don't do this now, this is it, last chance. This is it. This is where I make the real decision. It was one thing to see Jesus, but now I had to be all out. I couldn't raise my hand. And then they were about to close, and a girl across, she was on the left side, I'll never forget her, said, you know, Dave, I feel like there's somebody who wants to raise their hand. But they feel like there's a shackle on their arm. But if you just raise your hand right now, God will give you the power to do it. Man, my hand shot up in the air, and it was literally like taking a hold of a lightning bolt. And I just said the prayer, sinner's prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. You know, Jesus, just cleanse me from all my sins. Lord, I, I, I will give you all of my life. I surrender my entire life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me into the man you want me to be. And amen. And I am just, next thing you know, I am shaking. I'm laughing. I'm crying. That darkness just exploded out of me. And all the wow. love of God just poured into me. And it's, it was so different than anything I'd ever experienced in the occult. And I knew that I knew that I knew that it was real. And I went home that night and I lay down in bed. And I said, please let this be real because I've been fooled by so much stuff. And as I've often said, I woke up the next day to go to school. I opened up the window and it's like I saw color for the first time. In really? Life. Wow. It's where everything started to change. Now, was your friend with you that night again? Did he go back? Did he take it? Was his faith not real? He never, he did. The night that we went, his mother beat him up when he got home and said, you're never oh. going back to that Jesus move, that oh Jesus freak meeting again. So it's one of the heartbreaks yeah. of all that is that, you know, in the process I lost him huh. as a friend. But it was the beginning of the battle. It wasn't, you yeah. know, when you're that soaked in the occult and uh, it, it's difficult. And I was still brainwashed because this was my life, right? I had power. I had, you know, this influence and they took me out street witnessing almost immediately for those of you <laughs> who don't know what that is where they yeah. throw you in a car, give you some booklets and say, yeah. go talk to people about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So I had my little four spiritual laws and went up to somebody and said, Jesus loves you. I remember this person saying, why am I going to go to hell if I don't believe? And I said, oh, no, no, there's no such thing as heaven and hell. And then I went to somebody else, you know, Jesus loves you. Uh, well, I'll, I don't, you know, but if I'm not a Buddhist, I, that's okay. All paths lead to God. Well, somebody heard this nonsense and dragged me back to Brother Dave. <laughs> yeah. that so he was Maybe a little too soon out there, huh? Yeah. And Dave sat down with me and he got his Bible out. He says, come here, Greg. I just barely known the guy. He was really had a boldness that probably saved my life. He says, I hear you don't believe in hell. I said, so? He says, read this. What does it say here? He got his Bible appointed. What does that say? said, you know, those that believe will be saved and those that don't will be damned. Says, so I hear you don't believe in that Jesus is the only way to God. I said, so what? Read this, Greg. It said, you know, Jesus said, that, well, no one comes through the Father except through him. There's only one way. And he says, 
look, Greg, you either believe all this book, you can believe none of it. Jesus is either Lord of all of your life or he's not Lord at all in your life. I was so angry. Were you? I was furious because that sin nature just, they were not, I'm just telling you, Ron, they were not going to let go. All those things inside was not going to let go easy because now it's on the outside and it's like trying to pull me back. So uh, long story short, I made the stupid decision of going and having a seance with my friends. Oh, really? And because you were was, angry and you just. I was angry and it was, I don't have time for all the details. Let's just say instead of all that stuff that I used to know, showed up the demonic side showed up and i was scared to death so greg what would happen at these seances i mean what th these are real they're, they're real they really call and conjure up spirits and what what kind of things happen at these things well they either talk through people or they can do some sort of spiritual manifestation in a you know a cloud or orbs or some other weird nonsense that's going on that you know, they or they will just, you know, you'll hear something going on. You're looking for some evidence of something that's going on. You know, and I used to try and talk to some of my relatives that had passed away. It wasn't really successful, but I kept trying. But this time the other guy showed up and uh, I ran for my life. I thought I have made a grave error in everything. And I made a decision in one night. That's it. I was wrong. Everything I was taught was a complete lie. And I took like, I don't know, a hundred soap books. I don't even know how many books I collected and two Ouija boards and some amulets and, some, you know, other stuff and burned it all in the fireplace one night, just burned it all. And that was the point. Once it was all burned, I was done. You were done with it. So that was after that you went back and, and did the, uh, the seance and, um, and then how did you connect again back into your faith and, I just immediately ran back to the Bible study with my tail between my legs and said, I'm sorry, Dave, I really messed up here. They just, you know, lovingly accepted me. But yeah. I've been in contact with Dave before he passed away in the last few years, maybe 15 years ago. He and his wife contacted me because I'd written a, my story in a book called Nobody's Angel. And somehow they got a copy of it. And they said, you know, we, my wife and I always knew that something really horrible had happened to you, but we didn't know how to help. But what now we know what it is. And, you they know, didn't know at the time what you'd come through. No, but that healed up. There was it was a good, great connection that I had with with them again. But it was just uh, evidence to me of the goodness of God that He had brought me through all those years. And, you know, kept me intact. I'm, I'm just grateful. Every day is a gift to me. Every single day. I want to go back to your. Um, when you, you said you first started getting into the occult and then you started doing Ouija boards on your, and I'm not doing this to just uh, sensationalize the occult, but I just, I've got some honest questions that are, that are really fascinating to me because I want to understand what, what that meant. You said it got to the point where you, you didn't need a partner to do a Ouija board because a partner manifested what, and you, you even gave it a name or what? It spelled out its name as Steve Spade at the time. Yeah. And so I, I assume that was my spirit guide because that's what they teach you in the new age world is to develop a relationship with the spirit guide. Of some Did sort. you ever meet up with somebody by that name or was it just, just some it kind of spirit? I don't know where I'm 11 years old. I'm like, well, this is something to latch on to. Yeah. But the day that I rejected all that stuff, I think it was like a couple of nights later that spirit showed up in the middle of the night and it wasn't friendly anymore. It was threatening me. Really? I woke up, I was not able to breathe and I opened up my eyes and it was just right there. And this uh, was... I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the tools. All I could do is say the name of Jesus over and over again in my head until my lips would work. And it went away and I called a Christian friend and he just laughed at me. He says, don't worry about that stuff. It's just, the devil's stupid. That shows up again, just say, get out of my room in the name of Jesus. And so it came back a couple weeks late, later, and I stood up and did the same thing. And the thing was surprised, actually. It just disappeared and never came back. So, Did you, you know, one of the first books that I read, and, and I don't know if maybe he's been debunked, but back, I got, I got saved in 1976. And one of the books that was popular at the time was a book called Satan Seller by a guy named Mike Warrenke. And did did you 
ever encounter him? Did you ever know him or was he, was he t turned out to be kind of a fraud or what was the deal there? I'm glad you brought that up because, and that'll probably be the subject of another show. It's another time. Mike is a dear friend. Is he? And um, he was sabotaged along with uh, another friend of mine, Lauren Stratford and uh, another friend, Johanna Michelson and some other people that we were in a battle between 80, I'm going to say 87, about 95. We were in the midst of uh, rescuing kids from the occult, and from Satanism. And there was a concerted effort to wipe out Mike and to wipe out uh, Lauren and anybody else who was claiming that satanic crime was real. It was very deliberate. It was very organized. And, uh, you know, Mike would say to this day, he, you know, he made up a few things for his comedy show. But the basic stuff is absolutely true, and I believe that with all my heart because I know Mike, and I even have uh, even as one of his uh, people in his life that had no reason to support him anymore testified that that's who he was before he became a Christian. So I'm glad you got you brought that up. Yeah, because I did read something a while back, and it's probably around that time that you were talking about that was trying to discredit him, and I never knew what the real story behind that was. But it was a fascinating book to me you know, at the time um, of his, you know, his uh, journey through that. And it was very detailed in terms of, you know, places and names. And um, it was quite remarkable. Um, so now you're, you're getting harassed by, by these spirits after you've become a Christian and uh, you're rebuking them in the name of Jesus, claiming the power of the blood of Jesus and, and they're, and they're fleeing. Did you have any more, harassment from from these demonic uh manifestations for, for years uh there really? was yeah because one of the things when, when you turn away from that stuff especially if you were born to the breed so to speak if they had expectations of you uh they never forgive when you, you you're a satanic traitor so i i was a traitor now to whatever they had planned and so whatever workings they sent or things that still tried to harass me or whatever uh, and I'm not saying that doesn't happen to a lot of people, but when, there's a lot of people that come out of an occult background and they don't understand why things like this continue to happen. Um, and, and if anybody's listening to that, it, it, that's there, I don't want you to worry about it because Jesus is greater than all of that. They're just empty threats because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And just one person, even a child speaking the name of Jesus, can send 10,000 de demons to flight. So I continued to get some of that, but shortly after I got saved, I got called into ministry. Yeah. So being 15, 16, got saved. Next thing you know, I'm 18 and I'm in Bible school, and the rest has just been the wildest ride in the world. But uh, the worst of it probably for me in terms of processing all of that, it was in my late 20s when I had to deal with all of the awful uh, memories that I had just locked out, and uh, I had to come to terms with all of that. So that was a a whole different uh, different part of my ministry, I mean, my testimony, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Well, and I, and I want to explore that next week. Um, we're coming, as it goes so quickly, we're coming to the last quarter of the hour here. Let's. Do you mind if we take a few questions? That'd be great. Okay. Marisa, would you bring up a couple of questions here on... Um, okay. This is from Ed Arthur. Have you worked with people that were in the occult? I have probably for yeah ever since uh, I got out of the occult I have worked with people involved in the occult been involved in uh, what's called deliverance ministry I'm very shy about using that phrase because there's a lot of goofy stuff but we had to deal with people who were demonized to do whatever you, I just started to call them extractions because people do get demonized and I realized part of the call according to the scriptures in my name you'll cast out devils. So yeah, we've that's been a, a huge part of what we've done over the years. And, well, yeah, and I do want to get into this next week too because you've gotten involved in rescuing uh, young children or children in the occult and um, and so forth. Did Marisa, do do we have another question? Uh, this is from Brenda Chastain. Uh, Hi, Doctor Reed. Do you know if mobbing and gang stalking is involved with? Demonic activities. Thank you for your share, for sharing your testimony. Oh, you're welcome, uh, Brenda. I think once you understand how the demonic world works, you realize that 
all of these groups that are involved in illegal activities have their own demonic component. I think every gang that's out there, you can feel it when you go into their turf. You can feel the demonic lingering over it. So whether it's gang stalking or uh, occult groups or what we used to call child trading, now it's called human trafficking. There are, I believe there are very strong demonic forces, principalities that are guarding those kingdoms, which is why it's hard for anybody to break them up. I mean, child uh, trafficking, uh, way back in uh, 95, it was a $35 billion industry in child pornography and child trading. Can you imagine what it is now? It's a very well-guarded thing. And again, we probably talk about some of that Jeffrey Epstein thing uh, oh, yeah. next time. But it's, a, it's yeah, those things are all networked together in the place where Paul says in Ephesians, the powers and principalities and spiritual wickednesses in high places. And that's where the war eventually first has to be won. If we're going to rescue the victims, it has to be done through prayer. Greg, why, you know, one of the things that I've always known, because I'm, I'm, I've read a lot of books of testimonies from people from generally third world countries or countries where spirituality is kind of crazy, but they see a lot more direct manifestations, spiritual, demonic manifestations uh, in those countries than we see, than we typically see here. I mean, I think most people, other than someone like you and others who have who've gotten into the occult like that, we don't we don't really see that kind of thing. Does that, am I making any sense with my questions? Is it total? And and there's I think there is a reason for that. It's the same reason we don't see the same kind of miracles that places like yeah. Africa see yes. it's because we're told not to believe in them. Yes. And and because we're not most churches will not touch the issue of spiritual warfare and God bless my former church because they allowed me to actually teach a whole year of Sunday school on spiritual warfare. Uh, that is so rare, but most churches won't even touch it. I mean, and God bless Carmen. May his memory be blessed. He yeah. brought spiritual warfare to the forefront and many of us took it seriously, but now most people it's, it's like Keith Green used to say, nobody believes in me more. It's perfect. Because he can operate with impunity because yeah. nobody believes him that he's part of that. And I know C.S. Lewis said, you know, the, the mistake is either to think too much of the devil or not to think about him at all. And I think we're at the not thinking about him at all. So we're missing the opportunity to intervene spiritually to get people yeah. set free from this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Maurice, I think we've got some more questions that have popped up. Would you bring those up? This is from Kyle Keffer. In working with the spirit realm in terms of ministry and prayer, how do you tell the difference having been involved with both sides, as it were? Well, I think I understand the question. I think it's important that we, whatever we do in ministry to others is based totally scripturally. I think we want to evade, avoid anything that's of a, anything involved with like, contemplative prayer type of prayer or things like um, anything involved in meditation or or things like that or any any tools that are not biblically based. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to, to heal even the darkest wounds, but I think we need to be very discerning so that we're not using worldly tools which could be tinged by occultic things with the Spirit of God and His gifting, which is legitimate. So we have to have real strong discernment and only use that which we see in the scripture. Cont contemplative prayer, you say, is is uh, is a gateway. Is it is a? It, it can be just because it it part of it is that you just kind of empty yourself out, you know, and think over a whole word over and over and over again. Yeah, you know, yeah. Jesus is clear: we're to fill our minds, right? Not empty them or use vain repetition. One of the things that uh, I do want to. I'm just. I'm going to just hold this up because it doesn't. It's not going to make any sense to anything. But you and your and your website, you have ten ways to avoid being deceived. I think it's very. And I I, I uh, abbreviated it. I didn't go into all. But um, I'm going to go through them really quickly, and then we can maybe talk about them even next week. But your first one is read your Bible consistently, um, and then two is try the spirits. 
uh, which is which is your um, beloved believing that not every spirit, but try the spirits, scripturally it tells us, whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In 1 John 4, 1. Number three, question anything that seems off to you. Uh, four, pray for discernment, and you use 1 Corinthians 12, 10, which is uh, very various gifts of discerning spirits is one of them. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions about the background teaching and lifestyle of the messenger. Number six, uh, talk things out with others. Test every spirit, supernatural experience to see, hear, or uh, hear of, or experience yourself. Seven is test spiritual, test every spiritual, supernatural experience you see, hear, or if, oh, did I just read that? I dou doubled that, didn't I? Uh, and then one of the questions you, you would you would ask is, will the person teaching be open to respond to honest questions or will they wall you off with a band of handlers that keep them from talking to you? Uh, number nine, will the teacher prophet be willing to admit error if they are shown to be wrong? If not, you need to walk away. And number 10, avoid person-driven movements uh, and people, which all of those are absolutely excellent points. Because what there's so many people that get sucked into these um, these cult uh, alt, cultic and cult uh, practices. Um, so we, we could I want to dive into those next week, and we're coming kind of the end of the hour here. Um, was there any other questions that we needed to address tonight? Uh, another one from Ed Arthur. Is there? Uh, I guess you meant to say, is there such a thing as Christian meditation? I guess that would kind of go back to that. Yes, ab absolutely is. is. And here's, here's Christian meditation. Open up your Bible and say, Jesus, teach me by your Holy Spirit. And then you meditate on every word that you read. That's Christian meditation. Nowhere are we told to use Holy Spirit imagination. Nowhere are we told to. Imagination is good, but we're not. You don't want to open those doors. Those are occult doors. Stay with the word. Meditate on the word. If you empty your mind in order to get anything, you're not going to like what's going to come back. That's a good point. That's a good point. Another one there, Maurice, I think that just came in uh, from Jim Muslin. Do you see that one? Uh, have, have you been involved or experienced in exorcism or exorcisms? <laughs> yeah. So my team's listening to this and they're going, Oh yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. They're, they're in the next room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We've been involved in some really, really messy, hairy ones. And uh, not everybody can just, I think, I think you need to be ready to and know that the power of Jesus Christ can overcome that. But yeah, we, we've, we've had everything from a scale from one to 10 at some point. Wow. Wow. Now, when you say your team, you have a team that you that you work with, and well, you know, and I do want to get into all this next week because I think there's so much more there um, uh, that that we can get into. But I think another question came in that I wanted to get to uh, from Karen Lieberman. Risa, do you see that one? Uh, how to test the spirits giving dreams and I don't know if that's a question or a comment. How to test the spirits giving dreams and visions? Well, uh, that's a good point, and it's probably, again, probably would take a longer answer, but I think any dream that you have you think is from God, you see a vision, you just take it to God, and you test it, and you say, is this according to the Word of God? Does it contradict the Word of God? And the way you know that if it's from God is if it comes true or not, which is why there's a lot of people out there calling themselves prophets right now that have prophesied things that have not come true, yeah. and they have disqualified themselves because it yes. didn't come true, and people need to disconnect from that. Yes. And yes. I have a, a young, some young people that are part of my prayer and ministry team that we just kind of, uh, actually it's our Bible study night tonight. And they're oh, is it? In the next room, but uh, I'm thankful to God for them because they really helped me up at a time when the battle has gotten very stiff and I'm very blessed. Oh, that's good to have a team like that. Greg, in our final uh, minutes here, one of the things I want to do that I always do is because I don't know who's who's viewing or who's listening or who may be listening in the future because we get probably more views after the uh, live uh, feed that uh, accumulate. But what would you say to those out there maybe who are in the occult right now, who have dabbled in it, 
um, who are totally immersed in it um, and to those who are um, not walking with God, who don't have a, a relationship with God. I would tell you that Jesus loves you more than you can possibly ever imagine. And I can, I testify before the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing that you have done or been through that he cannot forgive and he cannot heal and he will if you just come to him and come to the cross. I know some people have made fun of the sinner's prayer, but that's what got me across the line, just coming to the cross and saying, Jesus, I'm, I'm broken, I'm a sinner, I know, I'm bound, and I need to know your love, I need to know your grace, and, and just say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I know you, I believe you died on a cross for my sins. Please come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and make me into the person you want me to be, and I surrender my whole life to you. You pray that prayer, you're going to be on an adventure of a lifetime until, until eternity, and it's worth everything. Amen. And you mentioned the sinner's prayer being kind of contrite, but, you know, it's really just the beginning, isn't it, Greg? Just it's the just, beginning. It's the point of confession, point of contrition, and just saying, God, I'm a sinner. Here I am. Come into my life. And that's just the, that's the, the surrender, basically, is what it is. And as you said, that the 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 adventure just begins then. <laughs> wouldn't and, trade it for the world. Yeah, amen. I wouldn't either. And um, it's amazing. So, folks, those of you who heard that, uh, who might be in that place tonight, I pray that you would that you would pray that prayer, as Greg said. It's just basically saying, God, I'm a sinner. I, I confess my sin to you. I accept your 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 gift of grace. Come into my life. Change me. Make me a Make me a, a person of, of Christ. Make me a Christian. It doesn't have to be a, a you know prepared text that you pray. It's just a simple contrition of asking God, asking Jesus to come into your life and take control of your life. And it, he's true at his word, and he will do that. It says in the scripture, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and he who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And God is true at his word. And so if you pray that prayer tonight, would you reach out to us and let us know at the upper room? Maurice is going to put a, uh, a website up or, or email address where you could let us know. Because we'd love to know that you made that decision. And uh, we would also like to send you a Bible if you don't have a Bible. That's prayer at the upper room presents.com. Prayer at the upper room presents.com. And uh, we're getting some feedback here. I don't know quite know what it is. Okay, we got that. Uh, we'd like to know. So let us know that. Um, Greg, thank you so much for doing this. And we're looking forward to next week. I want to dive into so many more of these things and talk about your ministry and the things that you've done. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we close out tonight? Well, just God bless you guys and the ministry that you do. And I encourage everybody to support the work you're doing. I know you're doing a documentary on Love Song, which is like one yeah. of my favorite groups. I just like to encourage people to get behind y'all and pray for you. You know, just God bless you for what you're doing. We appreciate it. Likewise. And let's pray for you and your ministry before we go. Lord, I, I thank you for Greg and for the obedience that he uh, that he that he has given you over the years. And I know that coming from the background he comes from, I can't even imagine making that that decision. But Lord, here he is and, and the changes that that you've made in his life and the impact that you've had. Uh, we ask that you'd continue to do that in the in the influence that he has uh, in teaching others and leading others, that you'd continue to anoint him and his ministry. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Greg, thank you, brother. And uh, we're looking forward to next week again. Have a good time with your, your Bible study group tonight. You bet we will. Thank you. Thanks, uh, folks. Thanks for watching. And thanks, folks, who, who have uh, given us questions. And those who have made comments, we'll try to get to those. And maybe, Greg, if you get a chance, maybe go to those. If there's some that maybe uh, would uh, like to hear from you, if you get a chance to do that. Absolutely. We always go back later and do that as well. Folks, thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week on live stream at the Upper Room. Take care and God bless.